Okay, so this is part two of my overview of the Radix Engine V2. And again, just to summarize from, from part one, um, Radix Engine V2 is a new way of developing smart contract functionality and de developing decentralized applications for DeFi, but in a, in a way that we think is much more suited to the real needs of DeFi. So in, the, in the part one of this, I talked about the fact that Radix Engine V2 gives developers a, a, a catalog of existing components that they can use to build common functionality without having to write things from scratch or without having to copy smart contract code off the shelf. And the other advantage was uh, the, the Radix Engine component approach where smart contract functionality functions more like intuitive things like quarters and gumball machines rather than uh, rather than bookkeepers that are writing entries and ledgers. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how it is that we do that and what the in a, in a way what the experience of building around this Radix engine is like. Okay. The critical feature of the Radix engine that makes this all work is something that we, we're calling the Radix finite state machine. Now, finite state machine is a, is, is a general concept. Um, you, this gets used in a lot of different places, usually in mission critical types of systems. Basically, all a finite state machine is, is it means that um, it's, it's, a, it's a type of virtual machine or system where there are very definite potential outcomes. It means that you, you can't have an unpredictable outcome. There's a, a fixed number of outcomes. Like, so, so what does that mean? That's a very abstract sort of concept. And in fact, in a way, the, uh, the, the Ethereum style of smart contract is a finite state machine. Um, it's just that it's kind of a black box finite state machine. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what's going in it, but ultimately this is code that's decentralized in a ledger. And so in theory, if you take all the possible things you can ask it and all the possible results, that is a finite set of states. But it's very unintuitive. It's very hard to predict, as I talked about in the, in the first part of the presentation. Radix has something very particular. Rather than creating these, the rather than having to create an island of functionality in a smart contract, we have a general concept that we're calling, and the, the name of this might change, but generally speaking, a, a universal Radix finite state machine. This is a, a single overarching finite state machine that's running on the network and everything else that people are building are running within that. And in some ways, it's kind of like an operating system. And what this means is that, is that components that get built on Radix as opposed to smart contracts on Ethereum, it's a, they become a much more well-constrained finite state machine rather than having an arbitrary thing where the, where the your bookkeeper could write anything in his ledger book, we have these things that operate a little bit more like gumball machines where you know a quarter is always going to act like a quarter, a gumball machine is always going to act like a gumball machine. Um, and this is all enforced by the, this, this environment that we're deploying to the Radix ledger that everyone gets to make use of when they when they deploy new crypto code. Okay, so let's let's try to make this very concrete. This is very abstract right now. Um, let's take this gumball machine example and try to make this very specific. Like, how would I build something that's like a tokenized gumball machine on the Radix ledger? Okay. If we look at the system of gumball machine, we can split this into a few components. We of course have the machine itself. Um, we have a quarter. This is the thing that you insert into the gumball machine to pay for a gumball. You have gumballs that, that are that are currently stored in the machine and would be output if you do the right thing. And then the fourth part of this is Rowdy Roddy Piper, who of course came to chew bubblegum and kick ass, but is all out of bubblegum. Okay, so how do we model these four different pieces in, in sort of Radix smart contract terms and Radix component terms? Well, we model it very much like the physical situation here. We have these four different components. There's a quarter, a gumball, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and the gumball machine. And each one of these things is, is defined in terms of what they do. So in, in the case of the quarter and the gumball, really their defining trait is that they have an owner and that could, there's only one owner at the time. So at the beginning here, the quarter is owned by Roddy, the gumball, uh, the gumball is owned by the gumball machine. That defines their identity. Um, whereas with, with Roddy and the gumball machine, you can kind of think of these as like containers. They have something like an account ID um, and they can contain quarters and gumballs. They kind of operate the same way in that sense, but obviously we'll see the gumball machine does a lot more than that. We can see some patterns in this though. So a quarter, in order to have an owner, it needs to be able to change that owner. So a quarter, a single quarter is part of a class of quarters and those quarters all behave in the same way. There's a supply, so there's some large number of quarters that are out there in existence. And each one of those individual quarters has a, what we call an action. And the action on the quarter would be transfer. The transfer action of the quarter changes the owner. It says, 
if I'm Roddy and I own this quarter, I have the right to hand that quarter to someone else or to change the owner to the gumball machine. And all of the individual little quarters within that class operate in the same way, but they can all have their own individual owner. Gumball is very similar, same sort of thing. It has a transfer action that can transfer from one person to another. And what this means is that both of those things, both quarters and gumballs, can be created from a single blueprint. We can call this a token blueprint. And a token blueprint is defined by the fact that here is something that has a supply. When we create, so when we instantiate that blueprint, there will be a number of those things that get created. And, and each one of those things, that you can call this a subcomponent for the individual tokens, each one of those things would have this transfer action that allows you to change its owner from one, one person to another, or one account to another. OK, so let's move over to the other side of the equation. Similar kind of thing. Both Rowdy Roddy Paper, Piper and the Gumball Machine can be modeled with an account blueprint. An account blueprint says, hey, I'm something that can hold tokens, and I have an account ID, which gives me sort of a unique identity. And that unique identity is used for the ownership of these different tokens. Great. Now, of course, the Gumball Machine is a little bit more complex. And so if I were building that Gumball Machine, I might choose to extend that blueprint. I might choose to import the, the, the basic fundamental account functionality into something that I call a seller blueprint. The seller blueprint would inherit everything about that account. It would say, look, I'm still going to like all this stuff about like, OK, this, is, can, this can own tokens and with certain rules associated with it. But now I'm layering on top of that a new action that I call buy. And the buy action would take certain arguments, basically. It would say that. Um, a buy requires that um, that there is a there is a certain type of token that comes in from a buyer, and if the buyer does the right thing, there is a transfer. Um, there is a I should say if the buyer is using the transfer transfer action of the right thing to transfer ownership to me, then I will as a result as a as a, um, a reaction to that I will use the transfer action of a different thing and hand it back. So same thing, if I see that some, a, a quarter has been transferred to me as the gumball machine, my response is I will transfer a gumball to the person who did that. So again, the gumball machine is defined in terms of what it does. It knows how to do this thing, which is what buy, and it's making use of the fundamental behavior of, of quarters and gumballs, which is a classic token. Um, we didn't have to re-implement the, the concept of token, and we get to reuse all that, that existing functionality. OK. This is our basic de definition of radix style component FSMs. Each one of these things is, a, is an instantiated finite state machine that comes from a blueprint. And a, each one of these things behaves in a, in a nice, predictable, physical sort of way. Um, this isn't something, you know, it's not as if just by having a finite state machine, you automatically do it. This is a consequence of this sort of operating system like system that we have with the radix engine. Um, with, where we have a particular finite state machine that we've constructed that encourages development in this type of pattern. OK, so using this, let's actually go through a transaction to see what this would look like using the system of components. Um, and this is going to be a, a composed atomic transaction. So what I mean by atomic is obviously we're going to have multiple tran multiple movements of, of assets happening at once. Um, which is what any gumball transaction should look like, right? So what we want to have happen is, if I'm the front end developer that's building an application for for Roddy Roddy, Roddy Piper over here, is I want to structure a transaction where a quarter is transferred to the machine and a gumball comes back to to Roddy. So, from his point of view, all all he cares about Roddy is saying, I want to use the gumball machine and I want to use this buy action on that. Great, but the buy action itself here in this definition, you can say that it in turn is is using the transfer actions of the gumball and the, and the transfer actions of the quarter. It requires that these other things happen. And so therefore, behind the scenes, the uh, the Radix engine knows to then say, well, OK, I now I need to go to talk to the quarters and I need to talk to the gumballs and make sure that what's happening here is going to be correct by the rules of quarters and by the rules of gumballs. Um, and so even though from a front developer, I'm just using one thing. I'm saying, I want to do a buy. But behind the scenes, the Radix engine can translate this into, into uh, what we call a set of, of state transitions. And we have something called a transaction constructor, constructor that builds a transaction that looks kind of like this. There is an input state. And that input state is basically all of the things that we know are going to be involved in this transaction somehow. So we've got Roddy, we've got the gumball machine, and the gumball machine in turn is saying, well, also, I'm going to have to involve the quarter and the gumball that we're, we're talking about here. And then there's an 
as the result of those actions, there's going to be an output state change, which is that the owner of the quarter is now the gumball machine and the owner of the gumball is now Roddy. And what this means is that on the ledger, we have, we have an independent set of state transitions. Now, this is a little bit complicated, but I, I wanted to mention this because this is really important to the shardability that Radix provides, which is a, a core feature of our scale, is the fact that each one of these state transitions can be handled discreetly, and we can make sure that all of these things happen to happen to happen once and happen correctly for the whole thing to, to be to be committed to the ledger. But if all these things are, are correct, if, if quarters are behaving correctly, if gumballs are behaving correctly, if the machine is behaving correctly, all of these things can be committed atomically from a, an input state to an output state on a sequence of shards. We can have each one of these components or each even sort of you know, pieces of the, each component state stored in independent shards, which provides a huge amount of parallelization capability. It means that we can have lots of different transactions happening at the same time, and they don't all tie each other up like it would on Ethereum, where you have to have these individual blocks. We can have quintillions of shards that are doing unrelated things at the same time. If you want to understand more about that, it's worth reading our Cerberus white paper. This goes into a lot more about the shardability, but really the key thing here is that is that this Radix engine approach enables this shardability at the same time that it's enabling the intuitive nature of development that we're building here. So, with that, with all that in mind, and I understand that this is a lot of a lot of content to go through pretty quickly. Um, you should have a little bit better view now of what this what this diagram means of the Radix engine. The Radix engine is this combination of things. It's a it's a constructor and a set of libraries that knows how to take a user request of saying, "Hey, I want to do a gumball machine transaction," and translating that into a set of state changes. Those state changes use the components that are on that are on the ledger, which were instantiated from blueprints. All of these things run within this structured Radix finite state machine that creates intuitive physical type behavior. All of this runs on a specialized Radix virtual machine that ensures all the correct things are happening. You can think of this as sort of running the compiled code. And in the end, correct things are committed in a highly shardable, parallelizable way using Cerberus consensus. So this is kind of the big picture of the Radix stack that we are currently building towards. Um, and we're very excited to share with you when it's ready. So, um, hopefully, this gives you uh, a, an overview of why the Radix engine is so exciting to us. Um, and over the coming months, we're going to be sharing a little bit more details about what writing scripto code is going to look like, how the component catalog is going to work, how you're going to write blueprints, um, and the, the components that, that Radix itself is going to deliver to accelerate development for builders. So um, thanks very much for your time. If you have any questions, you can catch us on Discord and Telegram. Um, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.